And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in foreign tongues. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You see, dear brethren, in today's epistle, that the Holy Ghost gave extraordinary gifts to the apostles. He gave them these gifts because they needed them. We just read about how they were given the gift of tongues. What does that mean? It's not in that in that weird, strange Pentecostal movement type of way where people jabber on about nonsense and just make strange noises. That's certainly nothing from God whatsoever. It's either just pure emotionalism or something diabolic. But the gift of tongues is an actual real gift from God. It is when one person speaks in his own nat- natural language and other people who do not speak that language hear what he says in their own language so that they may understand. So you know, the apostles preaching were heard in all these different languages despite not knowing those languages. And the word of God was able to spread that way. Also, combined with that, other extraordinary gifts were given by the Holy Ghost to the apostles, such as the, be- the ability to work miracles, that they were able to heal people and raise people from the dead, and that they were able to, to, to cause signs and wonders, which were, which were a- available to prove to the people that they preached to that they truly were uh, sent on a divine mission to talk to them. And they received the gift of infallibility. That is, that none of the apostles, after the descent of the Holy Ghost, none of them ever made mistakes pertaining to faith and morals. They were given the gift of impeccability. They never sinned ever again after the descent of the Holy Ghost. And they were given an in-depth knowledge of all the truths of the faith and many other different gifts that they needed in those times to be able to spread their mission throughout the whole world. They were charged with a great task. They were charged with, with starting up the Catholic faith all throughout the world. And this is something that was not able to be done by 12 men alone. God needed to assist them in a great way, and seeing as it is his church, and he's you know, obviously invested in that one true church that he, that he started, he does so. He gives them these extraordinary gifts, and those gifts help them to fulfill their mission. But the Holy Ghost didn't just give gifts to the apostles, nor did he just give gifts to those who ex- attained some sort of extreme sanctity, extreme high levels of piety that, you know, that we, we think, well, no wonder why they have these extraordinary gifts because uh, you know, they, were, they were practically uh, in heaven while still on earth. But rather, the Holy Ghost gives gifts to each and every one of us. He gives us all gifts as long as we maintain the state of sanctifying grace in our souls, we will be able to have ready access to the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Now, these gifts that he gives are not the extraordinary gifts that he gives to the apostles. We're not going to be able to, just because we're in a state of grace, be able to speak in tongues or automatically raise somebody from the dead. No, those are extraordinary. But the Holy Ghost gives us seven gifts that are promised to us. And these gifts are wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, fortitude, piety, and fear of the Lord. And these gifts I will explain to you presently. This is a a good lesson because how do we use these gifts? How do we increase in these gifts? We don't even really know, if we don't really even know what they are, to an, a, to a, to an, in an adequate way. The, the gifts, to start off, we have to understand what they are for in general. St. Thomas Aquinas speaks of the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost and says that these seven gifts remove entirely the barriers which divide us from God, especially by subjecting our conscience to the dictates of reason. So what does he mean by that? That is... 
St. Thomas means that the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost help us to avoid sin always and to choose to serve and love God because our higher nature, that is our will, is able to control our lower nature, our passions and our inclination to give into temptations and to commit sins. The first four of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and counsel, these are all there to enlighten our understanding of God and the faith of God. And then the last three, fortitude, piety, and fear of the Lord, strengthen our wills. And together, the seven do exactly what St. Thomas said. They remove the barriers that divide us from God. So, let's look at each of these gifts so we can understand how they help us in our daily spiritual lives. Wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom enables us to recognize emptiness of earthly things and to to regard good as, to regard God as the highest good. So, you see the emptiness of earthly things and regard God as the highest good. We, not have, we can see this in our daily lives of people around us. If someone lacks the faith, if someone does not have God in their lives, what are they usually doing? They're always striving to find one distraction after another. They're always engaging in some sort of you know, activity going from one group to another or trying to be part of, you know, different sports teams or trying to be part of different clubs or trying to, you know, engage in different types of entertainment because there's this unconscious void that is left there where God should be. God satisfies that and nothing else can. And the further away somebody is from God, the more distractions that they need. And the more that they need to be able to take away that necessity of self-reflection on finding God. God is the only thing that will satisfy that. All the earthly pleasures are empty. They fail to compare to that which is infinite, and that is God. Understanding. Understanding is different from wisdom. And understanding enables us to distinguish Catholic teaching from all other doctrine and to rest in it. We can recognize if a teaching is orthodox or not. That is the gift of understanding. So, Blessed Clement Hofbauer is a, is a, is a good example of someone who really, truly had a, full, a fullness of, um, of the gift of understanding. Because he didn't, he was the, the, they call him the apostle to Vienna. He was not one that began church studies early in his life. He began them much later on. He was, became a priest, but he only received the theological training necessarily, necessary just to be able to obtain ordination. Yet he was such a pious man, and he relied so much on the gift of understanding from the Holy Ghost, that great church dignitaries would come to him often and bring him these these works that were about to be published in books, these theological works, and then ask him to read over it and to see if it truly was sound in doctrine or not. And he would be able to find those little tiny errors that even a person of good will, of good Catholic moral foundation, can sometimes make by accident. He would be able to find those and pull those out, not because he was a great and learned man, but because he had the gift of understanding. He was able to decipher the good doctrine from the rest of everything else very easily by divine assistance from this gift of understanding. The third gift, knowledge. Knowledge is different from understanding. And what knowledge is, it enables a clear grasp of the teaching of the Catholic Church without special study. It is 
more of a contemplative knowledge. St. Thomas Aquinas speaks of, uh, of himself in this way, or shows this gift in his own life. St. Thomas Aquinas, as we know, is you know one of the most he's the angelic doctor. He's one of the most profound theologians. I've even heard him described as the greatest mind ever to live with the aid of supernatural grace. Saint Thomas Aquinas said that he learned more from the foot of the altar than he ever did from any book, because it was that knowledge of the things of the, of the faith. And, an under, and a way of grasping it for himself in that contemplation that was so much deeper than anything that could be written down. And so there's your gift of knowledge. It, is, you know, it differs from that of understanding where it is knowing the, the different pieces of the faith and understanding, whereas knowledge is that grasping it for ourselves because we become to understand God in a fuller way by our contemplation. The fourth part is counsel. Counsel enables us to know what the will of God is under under difficult circumstances. It's a prudence, if you will. A prudence that brings our wills closer in line with the will of God. We do not need a lot of time to deliberate if we have to know God's will, if we have the gift of counsel. We do not need a revelation to come to us if we have the gift of counsel. All we need is to follow what we know God would want us to do. It's, and as, this, as we increase in this gift of counsel, as we pray for that, we'll be able to, to see that more clearly in those difficult times. Many times we can see uh, the example of a saint who will, by their life, they will be given two choices uh, that they should follow. St. John Vianney is one, for, a, for an example, that you know, he's given the options in his life of either being that, continuing to be that parish priest, or he has this pull towards a monastic life to be able to, to end his last days doing penance for the good of souls. Naturally speaking, he wants to fall into that contemplative life. But because he has the gift of counsel, he knows it's not God's will for him. And so he maintains his pastoral life until his last days, he dies in, you know, at his parish church. That is following that counsel. He knows in that difficult decision to make what God's will is. Fortitude is the fifth gift of, God, of the Holy Ghost. Fortitude enables us to bear courageously whatever is necessary in carrying out the will of God. So, St. John Nepomucene is a great example of this gift of fortitude. He became, you know, he was um, he was born in, in Eastern Europe, and he became a priest uh, in che- in Czech, what is now the Czech Republic, um, and he w- went to Prague where he was a, uh, a priest, and then he became uh, the priest in, in charge of the royal court there. And he was the confessor to the queen in Prague. Well, at one point, King Wenceslas, who had known St. John very well, who uh, was on very good and friendly terms with the saint, uh, he became jealous and he became suspecting of his wife of being unfaithful. She wasn't, but that's beside the point. But King Wenceslas IV, he had become suspecting of his wife. And so he went to St. John and tried to get information out of him, tried to find out if what he suspected was true. Well, St. John told him he had no knowledge of anything uh, and that he should ask his wife. Well, King Wenceslas didn't accept that answer. And he said, well, you need to tell me what she has confessed to you in her confessions. And St. John refused. 
and Wenceslas made all these threats to him, and still he refused, and he maintained. And St. Wenceslas then threw him into prison. And yet, enduring a long imprisonment, he did not budge. Then he was tortured, tortured with red-hot irons, yet still maintained the, the seal of confession, and finally was drowned in the river, all the while never uttering a word to even come close to breaking the seal. That embodiment of the gift of fortitude shown in that great and holy saint. The sixth gift is piety. Piety enables us to make continual efforts to honor, love, and serve God more and more, and to carry out his will more more perfectly. That constant spiritual growth through our performance of our religious duties more perfectly. That growing in, in our prayers. That growing in our other virtues like charity. That growing, always searching for a way to do better. To grow in our spiritual life. That is piety. That, that, that even when it's difficult... We maintain that constant prayer for us, that we are searching for ways that every day we can improve, knowing that we're never going to be perfect, but we can grow closer to true perfection throughout in our entire life. That striving for holiness is, comes from that gift of piety. And lastly, the gift of the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord enables us to fear giving offense to God more than all the evils of the world. The fear of the Lord is is not a fear of punishment. It's not a fear that we're going to go to hell if we we sin. It is not a fear that God is there ready to strike us down of some sorts. But rather, it's what we call a filial fear. It's the fear that a son has of a good father that he would never, ever want to do something to let him down. He would not want to dishonor his father by the the actions of his life. And because that disappointment was worse than any kind of uh, subsequent effect that he might merit from that, any kind of punishment that might come from that. And so that is what the, fear, the gift of the fear of the Lord is, is that we fear to do anything that may offend God. The martyrs are all examples of this. Martyrs, especially like those early martyrs of the church, they were, would rather give up their entire life than even offer one grain of incense to false idols. To, to rather even give in, even in an outward way, even if they don't inwardly believe those things, uh, in order to save their lives. They give all in order to avoid the evils that are offensive to God. It's why, you know, we are here today. Because we refuse to give in to anything of the new church, because we know that they are contrary to the ways of God and to the teachings of God and to the true faith. So therefore, we would rather come and drive a long distance and to be at where we knew the true faith was was practiced and and a, a good, holy, pleasing sacrifice of the Mass is offered than to go anywhere else. That is, that comes from that gift of fear of the Lord. We do not want to offend him, let alone give in to sin. God knows for us in our lives. He knows the weakness of our flesh. He knows the temptations that assail us daily. He also knows that it's that conquering of these temptations, the conquering of our concupiscence and our lower nature. And in that increasing in love and service of him, it is that work that will get us closer to the divine will and will ultimately save our souls. Yet, he doesn't leave us to our own accord to do these things, because he knows that we'd fail. He's ready to aid us any way that he can, and he promises us these seven gifts of the Holy Ghost in our lives to help us. Think of it. The apostles were called 
to a specific mission. That was to spread the, the faith throughout the world. And God worked great miracles to allow them to do that. Each one of us is called to our own mission in our life. And for most of us, it's simply going to be saving our own souls and saving the souls that we're responsible for as well. And that mission, we need that same divine help that the apostles got. Not that we need these miraculous gifts, but we do need at least the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. He gives them to us freely. We have them in our baptism. We increase in them by our confirmation. And daily, we can grow in them by our prayers, by our asking for them, and by that constant overall striving for perfection. We're no different in our own makeup than the apostles that we have to follow God's will. And as such, the Holy Ghost will help us just as much as we need to save our souls, as he did help the apostles to be able to perform their missions. There's no barrier standing in his way other than the ones that we may put up ourselves. So be devoted to the Holy Ghost. Pray for the gifts. Find the ones that you most need in your life that will help you either overcome weaknesses or increase in love and service of Him. And by asking for Him and praying for that every day, He certainly, the Holy Ghost, will come to your aid as He does to anybody else who asks for His help. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.